and gamers together now have the sheer magnitude to be a significant unifying force for the world. If I'm to choose between a greater and lesser evil, I'd rather not choose at all. You are almost a jibble sandwich. Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? Be better. Check this out. Hello, 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 and welcome everyone to the 344th episode of the Hungry Gamers Podcast. I'm your female humble host, Brendan White. You can find me just about everywhere at Brendan 8 Bits. We are proudly powered by those audio-based legends at Audio Technica. Go and upgrade your audio game today over audio-technica.com. And joining me on this 344th episode, THG is a man with the best guns in the business and the best fringe on the podcast you can find him on them socials at buddy watson 12 buddy watson how the bloody hell are you i think i just tore my bicep flexing so uh maybe the muscles aren't all there at the moment so but um the fringe is definitely there i'm oh, good you, you're looking fantastic you've got a you've got a singlet on you know summer is upon us you're living <laughs> up there in the sunshine state the guns are out the buns are out the sun's out everything's out Everything is out. I'm actually upstairs at the moment. So if you've ever lived in Queensland, which you have, uh, if you live in a two-story house, upstairs is usually like a sauna. So um, if I pass out with heat stroke and uh, you don't hear anything, send help. Yeah, will do. I can make that happen. Does your hair, when it gets hot, does it get like a little bit jushy? Does it get a little does, bit of volume? It does get heat? a bit of volume. And I um, generally blow dry my hair anyway. Um, only when I go out or I'm like, not a, not a work day anyway, just uh, to get the volume so I can kind of pump that fringe back. That's the key, people. That's what Queer, Ooh, yeah. Queer Eye from the Straight Guy taught me in the early 2000s. Uh, back when the metrosexual days, they uh, they clothed me, they dressed me, they gave me all the uh, the tips and tricks to, to make me a well-groomed and uh, nice functioning young adult. And I've taken those lessons in the future. So uh, all my friends were like, how do you get your hair? Like around that era, like how do you get your hair so high or how do you get it so good? I'm like, uh, you just blow dry it, you know, come on. So he's handing off all my trick tips and tricks to them. I, I was going the opposite because that was like peak emo scene kid day. So I had, I stole my sister's GHD straightener and I was straightening my hair. So I didn't have the volume. <laughs> I just had the straight down. And I remember I'd always straighten my hair when it wasn't properly dry. So the water would hit those heating elements. It was just like, <laughs> and I thought I'd catch fire, but I never did. And yeah, the, the emo swooshy hair served me very well, but I nearly had a Britney Spears moment. Like yesterday, I, I nearly got the clippers out and shaved my head because I was very hot and muggy yesterday and I was sitting downstairs. And I couldn't get comfortable. I'm like, you know what? Fuck this. I got clippers upstairs. I'm just going to go up there and brrr, but I didn't end up doing it. But uh, who knows? Maybe maybe the shaved head will occur over, over summer because I feel it's going to be a hot one. The only problem with shaving your head is that you sweat more and it kind of comes out more. So as refreshing as it can be, you, you sweat way more. At least if you have long hair, it's kind of your hair is kind of damp and wet, but mm. uh, it's not kind of coming out and going all over your face and everything. So you're a wise man because yeah, I've I've always been a bit of a, a bit of a forehead sweater ever since I was a kiddo. I remember like playing sports and whatnot, and the old forehead would just <laughs> sweat like no one's business and. Yep. I, I got the crimson mask a few times over the years from like splitting my head open and just with the sweat catching up with all the blood and it was it was quite a scene. So uh, yeah, maybe maybe I need to work on the pros and cons of a shaved head versus a sweaty head. So you got give me something to think about here. Don't do it, Brendan. Don't do it. I'm telling you, I've had shaved Damn. hairs plenty of times. This is actually the longest my hair's been in a long time, and I'm not going to um cut it. I'm try, yeah, you said you were going even it. longer, right? Yeah, I'm going to try and grow it even longer. Uh, so I'm on a good good tear at the moment, but... It looks so shiny too. Like listeners, I don't know. Like if you haven't gone on to Buddy Socials and seen how <laughs> glamorous and luxurious this man is, do yourselves as a favor and head over to Buddy Watson 12 because he is bringing the vibes today. Maybe I'll put up a uh, more recent photo uh, oh, with yeah. my, my glossy hair. It is so shiny. Bring back the eyeliner as well. Hell yeah. Styling and profiling this man, but uh, maybe we might jump into this. The week that was. All right, buddy. We did make uh, a little gentleman's agreement on episode 343, and I need to say that I did not hold up my end of the agreement. I have shamed this house, and I feel <laughs> very horrible because I didn't play Spider-Man 2, nor did I watch Bottoms. So I'm 0 for 2. 
but you are two for two because you've uh, done more of the spider manning and went and peaked bottom. So where, where do you want to start this conversation off? Because I'm just an embarrassment to this podcast right now. So uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll start at Spider-Man because it's pretty, uh, it's just really an update of how I'm going and I am absolutely flying through that game. Um, I have 100%ed all the side missions and done everything in that game and I think I have done all the trophy progress as well and I just have four story missions to go and then I'll have finished in 100% of the game and got the platinum and it's pretty much all I did all of Monday on my day off and even the day before. So I think I went from like 40% of the game uh, almost to the end of where i'm at now and kind of one massive sitting on my day off good and session. um yeah the more i have played it the more I'm impressed i am this the side kind of missions and collectibles uh have enough variety to kind of keep it fresh and they don't kind of drag out too much um i'm having a really good time with the combat as well and all the kind of abilities that you unlock and uh, alternate between peter and miles and then the other big thing that i really enjoyed it as well is kind of uh, the different take on the Venom storyline um, and in intertwining Craven into, I guess, uh, Spider-Man's rogue gallery of villains and ha- kind of how they've given Craven as the uh, as as one of the main villains in it, and um, you know making that work and having the other villains in there as well. So um, I think the storyline's quite good. I'm still not sure if there's an- enough Venom in the game specifically when they did that 19-inch collector's edition uh, statue. Like that statue is awesome and Venom is the character, but I'm also kind of like, did he need to be in the game a little bit more than what he is? But um, that's probably the only criticism I can really kind of think of at the moment. But yeah, I'm, I'm loving my time with it or have loved my time with it because I'm almost finished and uh, hasn't overstayed its welcome too much. Mm-hmm. And um, I really pre- that's I guess I really appreciate that with a AAA open world game that's not just his 60 hours or repetitive tasks where all the side missions are kind of the same thing. You just go here, go there, do that. Um, there's been enough variety and, and hasn't overstayed it. Welcome. So, yeah, uh, I know it sounds dumb. Like I said last week or the last two weeks, uh, it has been a surprise for me that it's been this good um, for the style of game that I play and how I get engaged with video games. But you're very impressed and, uh, yeah, glad I picked it up and played it. Well, you are the noted uh, AAA hater. AAA amongst, hater, uh, bitch. Amongst games, media, and, and Ring sucks. Creators. So, yeah, it's, it's nice to see Spider-Man 2 buck that trend a little bit. And quickly circling back on the Venom front, I, I feel horrible because I can't remember the gentleman's name that did the, the voice work with Venom. He sort of said something in a recent interview where he said that, uh, you know, 90% mm. of the, his lines hadn't been used. So I'm mm. assuming we might get some Venom DLC down the line because... Yeah, it's such a stalwart, ca- or he, it, however you want to, you know, <laughs> quantify and classify a, a male and a, a symbiote. It's such a stalwart character from that franchise, and, and Venom's always been one of my favorites. So to hear that he didn't get enough screen time makes me think, combining that with that interview where they're like, yeah, most of the stuff I did is not in the game, makes me think, hmm, we've got some DLC on the way, maybe in 2024, who knows? Yeah, well, it's, um, his voice actor is actually Tony Todd, the guy who's from the original Candyman as well. Oh, yes. Fuck, how did I forget that? I forgot it as well until I just kind of uh, yeah, brought that up to send. But yes. Such a great voice. Sense. Such a great voice. But I ain't ever saying Candyman three times in front of a mirror because I don't want the bees and the hook to get me. Oh, the bees! The piss out of me. Oh, no, now, now, we're, now we're crossing films. That's I wish they are. did that in Candyman now I think about it. That would have been a great crossover oh speaking of but he's just whipped out this fantastic fantastic nicholas cage shirt with a lot of great nicholas cages over the years and you can see him in the wicker man in the bottom right hand corner <laughs> with the b helmet on what's it say is that threat thread so that's where Threadheads. you got the shirt from that's right that's a nice shirt it's a banger check out Threadheads and just search for nicholas cage if they've still got that shirt do yourselves a favor and put that on your body but also go to shopapit.net, put us on your body as well. But um, yeah, I am still going to play Spider-Man 2 before the end of the year. I made a promise and I will make that happen. But I have been playing, it's funny because I can't really say much at all about it because I'm NDA'd out the wazoo. But I'm going to say that I got into the alpha for Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Been playing that over the weekend pretty extensively on Xbox. And I'm avoiding spoils and being very careful because, holy shit, the NDA, I'm pretty sure if I break it, they own the house, the dogs, <laughs> my soul, my semen, my life. Like, I'm fucked. WB's got me, hook, line, and sinker. But the game, 
is really fun. I really, really enjoyed my time with it. I'm not going to go into specifics, but playing as the four members of, of the Suicide Squad is really fun. They're diverse. They're unique characters. The voice work is fantastic. The story is great. And the combat between the four is super, super fluid and super seamless and fun. So I'm back on the Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League bus because all this year and then seeing it's it's a live game and there's microtransactions and all that hullabaloo, I'm like, no, nah, I'm out. This looks like poo. WB has pulled me kicking and screaming back in and I'm excited to play this next year because it was fun. It was enjoyable. It was violent. And it was just the, you know, that superhero itch that I felt didn't need any more scratching because Marvel's been letting me down a lot lately. DC have come in and uh, you know delivered something solid here, so I'm, I'm hyped. Brendan, blink if you're under duress. Can you speak freely? Um, I can I confirm. <laughs> I can <laughs> confirm for the uh, audio listeners at home that Brendan is not being held by gunpoint because um, I find all of that shocking, and I know that you know you wouldn't mince your words e- either way, even without the NDA and kind of uh, give us that. But um, yeah, I'm shocked at that in like a good way. And I guess that's just my pessimism, uh, I guess the same as the internet. And, um, but it's uh, that's, that's a good sign. I'm glad that that's the case at the moment. Yeah. At the moment, like I didn't get to play a <laughs> lot with uh, three other random internet friends. I was constantly in bot lobbies cause I did find some of the connections when I was trying to join other squads with little janky. So I just turned it off and just went, you know, private had three bots roaming with me and that still was a good experience. But I feel, you know, say you, me and two others, jumping in and playing these four characters uh, individually would make this game even funner because there is some crazy frenetic combat and you're chaining abilities in here and you're zipping around the the battlefield and, and you got the, you know, the Harley Quinn quips and King Shark just being a giant sentient sea <laughs> creature that's just a badass mother. Like, it's a good time. And the Aussie representation with Captain Boomerang, the voice work and the vocal delivery and that Aussie bogan-ness that Captain Boomerang is, is fantastic. So yeah, I'm I'm a big fan. So Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is back on my radar for next year. I was out, but I'm back. Just when you think you're out, they pull you back in. They pulled me back in by big old Batarang, but I'm loving it. And I dipped a toe last night because Fortnite Chapter 5 Season 1 has officially released as of late Sunday evening. We're recording on Tuesday, the 5th of December right now. Managed to play a little bit last night. Are you just dropping in? Are you, are you Eminem now? Like what What wild character <laughs> in this game are you? This this is, I saw Peter Griffin from Family Guy. In it, <laughs> Peter the Griffin's in the game. It is fucked, man. Like, <laughs> no one is safe. No one is safe in Fortnite land anymore. And anyone that's played any form of game with a, a selectable character or a creator character in a game would probably know that 99.9% of the time I will either make or play female. I don't know why. Maybe it's escapism and curiosity as, as to how the other side of the, the world lives, but I'm usually a female and usually an anime character. Surprise, surprise. So <laughs> I was rolling last night as chun Lee. And then I shifted to uh, Mikasa from Attack on Titan. And then, who did I play after that? I don't know. But I have I have many skins. I've wasted so much money. We're talking about whales from mobile gaming the other day. I am a Fortnite whale. Like, <laughs> I am Moby Dick and I've been harpooned so many fucking times playing this game. I just have no self-control. I didn't buy an M&M skin, but I did buy the the emote. So I can drop a bit of couple of Eminem beats on people, but I didn't buy the skins. Hell yeah. But it's so fun. The the new chapter five season one that released, they brought in some new mechanics. They brought in like moddable weapons now, which is a really cool addition to the game. So you can find certain guns that might have different scopes and grips and whatever out in the field, or you can find benches to mod them up using your in-game currency to make yourself the perfect killing machine. Yes, Peter Griffin is in the game as like a, as a mini boss and you fight him and it's very weird because you shoot him and you, you take his shield down and then he starts doing a little maraca dance to get his, get his shields back God. up. It is a melting pot of pop culture, Fortnite. And that's what I love the most about it. Solar Snake is coming in, I can't remember if it's 50 days time in like a little standalone mini pass that you got to do to, to get Solar Snake as well. But yeah, no one is safe in Fortnite, man. Like everybody will be in Fortnite eventually. Like, I feel it's only a matter of time before you can pay to, like, maybe scan yourself in or become, like, 
Fortniteized and just be rolling in as a, as a generic skin because they would make so much money off that, especially off me. Do you think it's too late for someone like me that hasn't played Fortnite or briefly dipped in when it was building mode? Like, Never. Am I, safe? I, I hate building mode. Am I safe hate, in hate, no hate build it. mode? Yeah, no build mode is fun. If you feel like dipping a toe because it's cross-platform, so whatever you want to play on, I can take you through it. I've got regular people that I roll with so we can have some fun. And it is just a good time. It's just a good, casual, friend-based shooter. Like, yeah, it can get a little hairy and a little sweaty, but, like, it's just so dumb and so enjoyable because, yeah, you'll be rolling over there and you'll see John Wick getting teabagged by Wolverine and Ariana Grande <laughs> riding a motorbike. You're just like, yep, this is this is Fortnite. And this that just adds to the dumb silliness that is Fortnite, which I love because yeah, everything exists in there. It's It's like that scene in Ready Player One where everyone's yeah. going to battle at the end. It's like that, but just with a little bit more humor and a little bit more stupidness. So That's it's never wild. too late and it's free to play. So it uh, ain't cost you nothing but time. True, true. And we'll see. we'll see. Did you see on the back of Chapter 5 Season 1 dropping, they've got a Rocket League themed part oh my in, God. in Fortnite now. They've I did see that actually. They've got a Lego collaboration. And thirdly, they've got like a music based section in there. They've added like three new oh, modes no. outside of build and no build and then your, your custom creative stuff too. So Epic are doubling down and Fortnite just seems to be getting better and better. And these just quality of life improvements, cycling in and out new weapons, cycling in and out new mechanics. It always keeps things fresh and on your toes and it's just a good old time. I'm going to be playing a bit more of that after we finish recording, I am sure. Nice. You playing anything else this week? Yes, I am. Uh, Mr. Run and Jump. It came out earlier this year in uh, July. It's just dropped on PlayStation Plus uh, Premium as a 30-minute trial. And I thought it was such a weird thing to be only a 30-minute trial when a lot of games are like one-hour or two-hour trials. Um, but it made sense because this game only has 20 levels in it. Um, so I was able to kind of get through two of them uh, in, in that time. And it's a game that was kind of been on my watch list for some time. And, um, the fact that, uh, it was on trial, I decided to give it a crack. And this is the first time I've used that trial feature on that, uh, service as well. So, um, yeah, it's a pretty seamless, uh, thing, but basically Mr. Run and Jump is a side scrolling platformer that's based off a Atari 2600 homebrew game. So it kind of acts as like a spiritual successor or sequel to that. Um, And the game kind of starts off in that Atari style graphics uh, uh, with that kind of homebrew kind of built in um, just with your one jump button and very simple, easy platforming if you're thinking like the Atari platforms. And then you transform out of that world into a modern world that's kind of full of neon... uh, 80s hyperfixed color scapes uh and then you have like a double jump a dash uh an ultra jump and then all of a sudden like the difficulty you can wall jump now and the difficulty in the levels uh is kind of ramped up to what it was just before with your your old school just uh running and jumping over and and simple basic platforming and now you're getting like collectibles in the levels uh there's three secret things which are uh, much harder challenge rooms so think of like the way that celeste kind of runs or even like your Meat Boy, but maybe not as masochist as uh, what Meat Boy is. Um, Because without the, the, I guess, the time trial modes that you can run back in after you've defeated a level, the collecting part is quite generous in its kind of checkpoints and um, difficulty in what what I played so far. And that was just the first two levels, like I said. But there's an extra challenge in there going through and doing all the time travels and getting like, you know, gold and platinum times. I was unable to get the platinum time or get close to the gold time for the first level. It was like just a little bit off that. So um, the whole idea of like maybe picking up that game in the future and then trying to go for the platinum trophy where you've got to get the 20 platinum time trials is the, like the most difficult um, trophy in that. That could be something that tickles my fancy, but mm-hmm. definitely uh, a buddy game. I, I just, the price point when it came out was a, not in my wheelhouse at the time. I think it was like 38 bucks and I have a lot more indie games to play before uh, the end of the year with Humanity, Teardown, Cocoon, uh, Chance of Sonar, all that kind of stuff. But it's definitely in the back of my mind if uh, it drops on a sale or goes cheap or if I am able to plow through a lot of those other games, I'll definitely um, pick this up at some point. Lots of fun. It looks really pretty. Like the yeah. the, the way they utilize the neon in this, like it is popping. <clears throat> it is vibrant on my eyeballs i'm just looking at some steel images in a trailer and i'm like <laughs> holy guacamole like am i under some influence right now looking at this like it is a fever dream and yeah it looks looks fun i love the the super meat boy and celeste comps yeah it's certainly not as not as gory and uh 
viscera based like uh, Meat Boy is, but it looks interesting. Yeah, 38 bucks is probably a little rich for, for my blood too. But yeah, if, if it does drop on sale or makes it makes its way to like Game Pass or something, I'd certainly jump mm. on and play this for a little bit on a rainy day because yeah, that free flowing and the level design is very specific and very precise. And I like those challenges in these types of games. I know that it'd make my blood boil at times until I get into the rhythm and the routine as far as the timing, but it looks good. It looks good. The color palette just gets me. Yeah, it's it's very good. And it looks like it, the difficulty ramps up uh, quite hard um, pretty pretty quickly as well. The cool thing about it is they, they teach you all those extra abilities that you don't have in that original game with the double jump dash and all that kind of stuff, wall jumping. They teach you that basically in the first level. So you're pretty much equipped with everything from the get-go. Um, so it kind of drip feeds it to you and um, mm-hmm. then you kind of basically have all the tools at your disposal from the start. So I'm imagining it's going to gonna go pretty wild pretty quickly. Nice, nice. Something else that's gone pretty wild the last couple of years, obviously, is Squid Game, one of the, the most popular <laughs> TV franchises of all time parked over there on Netflix. I... Uh, Got, well, didn't get roped into, but I was talking to uh, Jamie Apps from Pario Magazine the other day about this, and you got to talking about it, and I'm like, you know what? I enjoy a good trashy game show. I enjoy a bit of drama. So I fired up Squid Game The Challenge, as it's called, and that's a 10-episode uh, game show series based off the, the Squid Game uh, television show, the, obviously the South Korean drama slash tension field jaunt that is available on Netflix. And yeah, we've still got the 456 players running around in this actual game show where they can win the single largest cash prize in game show history so the winner walks away with 4.56 million us dollars like whoa it's a lot of bickies a lot of bickies how many people Um, are playing 456 wow okay yeah it plays off a lot of the tropes and the concepts and the games that you've seen if you've watched squid games so they do go through like the cookie where you've got to sort of scratch out the star or the umbrella or the circle or there's red light, green light, and stuff like that. But um, it's interesting to see these these players in this game adapt to it because, yeah, ev- even though it is a game show, like we've seen Squid Game, big spoilers, people die when they fuck up in these games in Squid Game. In this, they've just got like a little a little die pack in their uniform. And so when they, oh my when they God. die, it goes like, and then they've got to fake their death and just fall down, which is fantastic in itself. But there is... <laughs> A lot of drama in this. There's a lot of heroes, a lot of villains, a lot of face and heel turns with some of these people because they're playing the game. Like, that's a lot of money to win. Mm. There's only nine episodes out at the moment. The finale drops this week coming, and I know who the final three are, but I don't know who's going to win. But it's been really, really enjoyable because it's trashy. There's some snakes that you hate. There's some people you root for. And because no one is safe and people are just like in air quotes, dying left, right, and center, your your favorite could be gone in the first episode, 10 minutes into episode two, because these games are constantly such at a high stake. Yeah, ain't no one safe. Like people are dropping off like flies everywhere. So it's kind of cool to be riding this roller coaster with them. There's a few people I think that are just taking the piss and playing a role that maybe the producers have sort of said, you have to fit this archetype. But overall, I've been vibing it so far and... Yeah, imagine winning four point five six million dollars. That's wild. Yeah, yeah. You get to the final three, like, hey guys, like, let's just split it. <laughs> and you want to guarantee? You want to guarantee like that we all get out of here with at least a million? Let's just, just split it. Come on. Yeah, it's um, it's really cool. Like, I'm not going to go into specifics of characters for the most part, but like, there's actual a legitimate mother and son in there playing together. Uh, there's like high school friends and, and whatever else. So there's there's every every sort of archetype you can think of as far as people from every walk of life, the jock trope and the nerds and stuff like that. But surprisingly enjoyable. I crammed yet yeah, all nine episodes over the last couple of days very quickly. And something else that I want to highlight that finished up a couple of weeks ago is I've ran the gamut on the full eight episodes of a show on Apple TV Plus called Lessons in Chemistry which uh, has Brie Larson starring as Elizabeth Zott. And she is a lab tech chemist. Uh, and this is set in the 1960s where after she sort of um, gets fired, she uses her new job hosting a 1960s television cooking show titled Supper at Six to educate housewives and, and general people viewing on scientific topics. It's 
really heartfelt, really emotional, made me cry in a couple episodes because there is some really, really commanding performances. Brie Larson, we've both gushed about her several times the last couple of weeks. She's just a powerhouse on screen. It's relatable. It's very mm. honest and it wears its heart on its sleeve. And eight episodes is just a perfect runtime. Like it doesn't overstay. It doesn't fatten out the story unnecessarily for for more views. And yeah, it's really, really enjoyable. Like it was happy, sad, joyful, embarrassing at times because it wanted <laughs> to be like, it's really, really well done. It's based off a book of the same name by Bonnie Garmus. And the book only came out, I think like a year or two ago. So it's been translated to screen wow. really, really quickly, but it's great. Production quality is really fun. Jason Bateman's one of the executive producers on this. He's doing a lot more stuff behind the camera these days, which I love because he seems to have a real knack for that, at least from what I've seen him attached to recently. But yeah, eight episodes available on Apple TV plus really cool period drama you know, tying into to real historical events and things, but also obviously creating some fresh characters to weave into that that sort of uh, melting pot of culture and sexism and racism in the 60s. So it's, uh, yeah, really, really well done. And, and yeah, I love it. It's one of my favorite new shows of the year. Sounds pretty cool and looks good as well. I'm just having a look at some of the stills and having uh, you know, a bit of the write-up as well. Um, it's got big, I, it's, and I guess it's more of a drama than a comedy, but it, I guess it gives me the same kind of vibes as like Mrs. Maisel. In a, in a oh yeah yeah degree, i can see degree, that because yeah. i absolutely love that show on amazon so it looks and reads and sounds and specifically what you've kind of said about it is like a, a mrs mazel type architect but more dramatic like dramatic mm-hmm. than, the, than the comedy and maybe a bit more heartfelt so yeah yeah cool. so yeah check that if you want something that'll pull at the heartstrings might make you laugh might make you think back to how fucked up things were in the 60s for for certain you know races and sexes especially so um yeah it's, it's a really good microscope on on society back then and and it's just good easy watching and yeah brie larson i've said it a million times i'll watch her do anything and yeah she nails it as elizabeth zott it is a good time so yeah lessons in chemistry on apple tv plus definitely a bit approved from my side but buddy you held up your end of the bargain and went and checked out bottoms was it worth the cost of admission it was, and yes. uh, this is a movie that I've been waiting for for some time, and I missed out on a few advanced screenings, and uh, it's out there on the internet for people that want to see it uh, and have the means and the ways, but I was kind of waiting for it to be in the movies because I wanted to see it on the big screen, and uh, it did not disappoint. Um, it's directed by uh, Emma Sleekman, who um, has teamed up once again with uh, Rachel, uh, I think her name is Sonnet, uh, who did Bodies, 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 um, who's hilarious in that. Uh, she was also in Emma... Um, uh, Sleekman's debut. She was a star of that in Shiva Baby, which I haven't seen but I've heard good reviews about. And it's basically about uh, two lesbian high schoolers who uh, kind of want to finally lose their virginity because they're kind of nerds and, and not really into with the popular group and that kind of stuff. So um, to do that, they kind of capitalize on the, the rumor of a, a rival football team that's finally visiting their town um, that's kind of beating up people. So they kind of start like a, what they call a fight club uh, and try and kind of kill these girls and uh, disguise women's solidarity uh, to kind of um, lose their virginity and uh, get with other girls. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, got a really funny premise. It kind of reminds me a little bit um, kind of like the same premise as not really American Pies, but more of like a, a super bad or, um, mm-hmm. or, or book smart, which kind of felt like a more uh, modern day um, super bad in a contemporary high schooling uh, setting. Um, but what I didn't expect it was, it was probably a little bit more campy and silly the little notch was like a little bit more turned up where i felt like maybe it's my own expectations that it was going to be a little bit more all right i don't know how this is going to go but it's going to be like in a more dramatic and there's going to be heartfelt finding coming of age type thing edge of 17 and you know super bad when they realize you know whatever realizations they have and book smart when they fight and all that stuff but um the, the silliness and little campiness kind of didn't ha- it still had that kind of moment but uh took away from that so i thought you know i kind of wasn't ready for that but it wasn't too much to the degree where it kind of ruined it um it almost felt like it was like almost a a parody of what we think a high schooler is now or those kind of archetypes like the the jocks that are kind of um with the cheerleaders and you know cheating on the cheerleaders and that they want to get with uh always in their football uniforms even in class uh just you never see them in plain clothes so it's Mm -hmm. kind of that's kind of funny but yeah everyone's quite good in it uh specifically the other young girl that um is opposite rachel sonnet which i 
hadn't seen before, but she's in a, been in a few things this year. Her name is uh, Ayo Edabiri. She was in um, Spider-Man Across the Universe. Uh, she was also voice acting in the new Turtles movie as well. She starred in Theatre Camp, which is um, kind of a sleeper comedy of the year, which is kind of coming out next week on um, streamers as well. So, uh, yeah, I was just pretty impressed with it all around. Banger soundtrack. Um, I'm a sucker for coming-of-age movies and specifically comedies and that high school genre and setting. So, yeah, it was it was a good time. I need to check it out because, yeah, we were talking about it last week on on 343 and and it given that synopsis and then I checked out the trailer and, yeah, the the vibe that I'm getting from the trailer is is something that I feel I'm going to enjoy very much. So I'm now hearing it broken down in a little bit more of a structured manner. I'm very disappointed in myself that I didn't go and watch it this weekend, (laughs) but I had uh, NDAs not to break and um, Squid Games to watch. But, uh, yeah, maybe I need to expedite my timeline to check this out because yeah it's it sounds like it's going to be a fun little film and um maybe yeah like you said one of the sleeper hits of uh 2023 um marshall lynch was in it as well as one of the school teachers for the girls and um apparently a lot of his lines were improv and it's just kind of absurd seeing his his character in the in the setting that it was so um that was pretty cool nice nice i'll keep my eyes on it anything else you've been playing or watching you wanted to highlight or shall we jump into the news let's jump news and notes from around the internet presented by audio technica all right we did speak about this indirectly in the what we've been playing but uh this little bit of news is titled the future is bright in fortnite fortnite's highly anticipated live event the big bang dazzled audiences with a nostalgic nod to the game's origin and exciting peek into its multifaceted future this past weekend Amidst a throwback season featuring the original map, the event drew an overwhelming crowd, causing server congestion as over 10 million players flooded in while millions more watched online. My goodness. As the countdown hit zero above Dusty Divot, players relived a condensed version of the game's iconic The End event, witnessing the island's cataclysmic transformation into a black hole. However, Epic Games confirmed that the original map would resurface due to popular demand in 2024. I think that's personally not needed. It was fine to play the original map, but I got my fix and I'm done. Don't need to bring it back. But anyway, the real spectacle began when the unveiling of three new modes set to debut, Lego Fortnite, Rocket Racing, and Fortnite Festival. Each mode represented a distinct universe within Fortnite, offering glimpses into Lego-inspired survival, futuristic racing, and a music festival experience featuring renowned artists. The event showcased Epic Games' ambitious vision for Fortnite's evolution beyond the confines of the Battle Royale genre, and emphasized a seamless transition between diverse gaming experiences, highlighting the player's adaptability and versatility. Despite the lack of teasers for the upcoming Chapter 5 storyline, the focus on these new modes underscored Epic's dedication to diversifying Fortnite's offerings through collaboration with Harmonix, Lego, and Psyonix. A lot of X's there. Overall, the Big Bang signaled Fortnite's trajectory as an ever-evolving and boundary-pushing entity, teasing a future where players can effortlessly navigate between various gaming experiences within the expansive Fortnite universe. So, buddy, that was a lot of words, a lot of big words, a lot of great big descriptive words, but I think it really wraps Fortnite up in a bow as far as current and future slate. They do these big reveal events better than just about anybody, and you can see by the fact that 10 million people check this out. Like, uh, you know, Trev from Bitstorm, who's a big Fortnite tragic at the moment, he got up at like 4 a.m., I think it was, to watch this. And yeah, couldn't get on because the server congestion. So he wow. watches online with with millions of other people. But like, it has become a, a bigger than gaming event. These live events, these live showcases and recaps, they've become like uh, history making must sees uh, within gaming space. And um, I feel with every every bit of Fortnite we talk about, you, the, the cogs are turning in your head. And you're like. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I get that download going. I need to go to the next live event. I need to jump on and play a bit of uh, rocket racing or maybe attend a Fortnite festival. Like I feel I feel you're getting close. I actually have it downloaded um, just in case. Yes. I think it's saved on my hard drive. All I have to do is copy it across. So it's one of those emergency games that I just have that I know a lot of people play that at any point someone could go, hey, you want to play Fortnite randomly? Even though that will rarely happen. Uh, I'm, I'm equipped to do it. So uh, I'm messaging it- you right now. <laughs> Uh, sorry, recording podcast. Uh, can't do it. Um, but yeah, it's it's part of the zeitgeist now. It's kind of the game is bigger than the game. Uh, yeah. It's it's weird in the same like I don't know the history behind Fortnite and um, Epic Games and Epic Games as a store, but uh, 
was Epic, uh, excuse my ignorance, was Epic Games Store a thing before Fortnite? No. no. Okay. It, it was built off the back of Fortnite, just blowing the heck yeah. up. Okay. So it's kind of like, um, uh, who's the other? Who, the, like like, Val- like what happened Valve, Valve and Steam? Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. So off so- the successes of the games they released, they built the store. Yeah, and then Steam's the biggest like game distributor in the world right now, um, platform. And then now Epic has made its way in to the point where it's like whatever price and valuation is to the point where Sony is investing in it like 0.2 or 0.5 percent or whatever. And that was like you know billions of dollars or millions of dollars. I can't remember what the uh, what the figure was, but it's just another kind of big tentpole that is changing the way the industry is operating. And um, as far as like the structure of it with the store, but then the way you deliver content is now uh roblox games in games minecraft that kind of shared worlds um and now this it's just i don't know it's just wild you if you told me this like 10 years ago i would have laughed at your face like no chance the numbers would hit this or no chance this was a thing that was possible or pe- people would care about to this degree and even if you told me this like two or three years ago, like <laughs> when, when, years ago yeah. when it was just build mode and it was <clears> popping <throat> off and people were like oh this is going to happen you're going to have a great time like i despise what? fortnite with every ounce of my being for many years and publicly shit canned the game often on this podcast. And yet here I am on the other side of the coin now singing its praises because your epic of transcended gaming and they're doing these live concerts and live events. And like you said, there's this places now where you can just go and build stuff with your friends or your kids or your family or with randoms in the creator mode. There's uh, these these music festival experiences tied into Fortnite Festival. There's the Rocket Racing collab with Rocket League and all the cool stuff they're doing there. And, and then like Lego, like I think that's the biggest get. Like Lego are so focused and protective of that brand. They don't want to collaborate with ev- just about anybody. So the fact that Epic have managed to get Lego to, to handshake and sign on the line to put their branding in this world is huge. And I can see it having an ascension like maybe we'll never beat minecraft or roblox but i feel it could be right up there as maybe the third one or like the one c as far as a potential hub for young kids to go in there now and, and play you know fortnite x lego because that sounds like fun i love lego and and the thing that's underrated of like fortnite epic and um not just the zeitgeist and like i said before how they changed like the the structure of the industry they're also from memory the first game that kind of flipped on the switch to do like by accident to do like oh cross-platform play is actually possible oh okay we accidentally hit a switch uh, even though sony didn't want us to it kind of broke down the barriers between that and so many other games do do that as well so mm. yeah they've they're been a bit of a trailblazer uh, epic have when it comes to how games how games are sort of built and developed how now their back end like epic game store is it's the not re- the remuneration for the developers. Yeah, I was about to say the, the revenue splits for, for devs, like there's heavy incentives to chuck your games on Epic as opposed to Steam because you're making a lot more money. Yeah, you're reaching less eyes, but how many less these days? Maybe not mm. as little as like I never go to Epic and peruse their store. I just play Fortnite and that's it. But if I was hunting for maybe some indies, I'd, I'd probably peek that instead of Steam first if I know that's going to help the dev a little bit more. But yeah, jump on in. Chapter 5... Season one, it is a heck of a time. I, I did actually send you a message. Before, I know, I so saw you it. better respond later. And, and if you're around, be down to crown, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, it's a good time. Something else, it's, it's, been a, it's been a big week of unveils already, and it's only Tuesday. So off the back of what we just talked about with Fortnite. The biggest one of the week. Here it is. Yeah, it's, it's a happening time, kiddos. I just wrote, Girls, Germs, No Returns. Today, Naughty Dog released a gameplay trailer for the compelling No Return mode, a new single player offering being introduced in The Last of Us Part 2 Remastered, which is coming out on January 19th on the PlayStation 5. Players will need to fight tooth and nail through a series of randomized encounters featuring memorable locations from the main campaign, as well as unexpected enemy formations. Each run will feature explosive boss encounters with various gameplay modifiers offering new and unique challenges. Ellie and Abby will be playable along with never before playable characters like Jesse, Dina, Tommy, Lev, and more. Each character will have their own unique traits to offer a variety of play styles and there will be a wardrobe of unlockable skins for each as a reward for your efforts. So as the resident Naughty Dog Last of Us fan here, primarily in section of the game that uh, we're still eagerly awaiting a formal announcement on, how did this feel for you? Because this snuck out because 
the next bit of news we're going to talk about after that is <laughs> even bigger. But this one, cheeky little like 90 second trailer highlighting no return mode. It looks stunning. It looked violent. It looked creepy. I'm interested in this and I'm looking forward to paying my $20 upgrade to uh, get my remastered version on PS5 on January 19th. 100%. And um, I guess it, the first thing I got from the trailer was uh, there's a horde of zombies coming out, which in the snow rain, uh, snow-filled Jacksonville town, um, which I guess you don't have that kind of combat in that part. So I'm keen to see the different type of combat encounters you have in parts of the world that you usually don't have um, and kind of dealing with that. The coolest thing that happened outside of like the, you know, the non-playable characters in the game, um, they kind of have like a what is it like a cork board going through the trailer that has kind of um uh places in it so the first one is like hardware store and then it has uh, underneath it hunted so i'm guessing that's a portion of the level that will have you kind of like hiding or enemies seeking out you and kind of upgrading in between different locations and stuff and then the like the next one uh, I can't remember what it was, but there was like a different portion of the town. So it had the hardware store hunted. Um, the next one was kind of the forest assault. So kind of maybe going through like a wave of enemies and stuff. So I like the idea of, uh, and the next one was like hold out. So I like the idea of like going through different waves and having the kind of different um, experiences with it, whether you're kind of, you know, hiding or unleashing or all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, the idea of it being roguelike has kind of hooked me as well. I didn't really kind of, grasp what this was until i saw the trailer today like reading that kind of press release that this was getting added in recent years two of my favorite games of each year have been returnal and sifu which are both roguelikes and i never really played those and then i enjoyed hades as well so um it's probably got me more excited for it and actually seeing this trailer and kind of it kind of getting mapped out what it was the roguelike the kind of the different mods each run everything changing uh yeah it looks it looks awesome i'm way more excited for this now than what i was before it looks stunning and unforgiving and punishing and, and yeah that roguelike <laughs> wrinkle thrown into this as well where you are going to be getting fresh runs fresh mechanics different enemies or different navigate the these maps or these little zones every time it's going to keep things feeling very fresh so i'm looking forward to jumping in and I do love that they do have an assortment of unlockable skins that you can you can work through because I, I saw Ellie in the back end of the trailer wearing like a space suit. So you can start to lead a little bit of silliness in your playthroughs where you can kit out your preferred characters in certain ways. And I like that each character has potential traits. I didn't really see how that's broken down if maybe you know, comparing, say, Ellie to Abby, maybe Ellie's faster on the feet where Abby can withstand more damage. Maybe it'll be stuff like that as far yep. as... They'll break them down as far as those traits. But uh, I like that it's going to feel fresh. It's going to feel different and it's going to feel new while also rewarding you with those skins and, and little cosmetic nothings that can really personalize your experience as well. So yeah, I'm keen to uh, spin this up in uh, two, not even two, like a month and a half's time on yep. the 19th of January. We don't have to wait long at all. Reminds me like looking at how great the combat is in Last of Us 2 and an improvement on Last of Us 1 and how quickly you can feel overawed and a sense of dread when there's only just like two or three enemies on the screen. I think it's something they capture quite well, um, almost akin to like a horror movie, which is when there's like you know, the big bad or you know it's only one killer there, but uh, kind of you're against the odds uh, yeah. and you always have limited resources. So I think it fits perfectly for that world. Uh, and seeing Ellie whip out the flamethrower towards the end of that trailer, which is uh, one of my favorite troll weapons in factions, uh, smoke bombing instead of <laughs> running up and shivving somebody, uh, whip out the flamethrower and then flame them to death. Uh, thanks to one of my online players that kind of gave me that class, Gary. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm keen, for the, keen to get my flames on. Yeah, it, it looks great. Like I can only imagine how stressed I'm going to be with old <laughs> Rat King chasing me around again. Oh, because, yeah. oh my goodness gracious. It's going to be a time. And knowing that you've got that roguelike, you, you might get into a rhythm against a, a Rat King or an enemy X and then they kill you and then that rhythm's gone because they might come at you from a different angle. The The landscape's going to be changing and evolving. So, yeah, I know I'm going to be very stressed playing this uh, this mode, but I'm looking forward to it because, yeah, it looks stunning and I think you perfectly described it where you, you, you never feel overpowered. You, you, even if it's only one or two enemies in, in your shared space, one misstep and you're cooked. It's not like you're running around being a one-person army. So, um, yeah, bring it on. January 19th. I'm excited. Woo! 
All right. I guess we should uh, talk about the biggest news that's done the rounds in the last several hours or so. GTA 6 has been the subject of immense anticipation and its official reveal trailer arrived a day sooner than scheduled due to surprise, surprise, (gasps) a leak. This unveiling confirms several speculations previously circulating within the gaming industry. The game is set in a contemporary iteration of Vice City, a location fans had long suspected would serve as a backdrop for the next installment. Alongside the urban setting, players will explore the surrounding countryside, offering a diverse and expansive environment to navigate. One of the trailer's significant reveals was the inclusion of both female and male protagonists, a first for the Grand Theft Auto series. We meet GTA's first ever female protagonist, a Latina named Lucia, who begins her story in prison. The trailer showcases her crime amidst a backdrop of social media, hinting at its significance in the game. Tom Petty's Lovers Along Road accompanies car-related crimes, unexpected alligator sightings in Florida. Lucia and a male character appear as partners in crime, emphasizing unity to overcome challenges in a narrative drawing inspiration from the infamous bank robbers Bonnie and Clyde. This addition marks a progressive step forward for the franchise, including uh, introducing much more diversity and depth to the gameplay experience. Despite early industry predictions placing the release within Take-Two's 2024 fiscal year, the confirmed launch year of 2025 came as a little surprise. This delay might be attributed to Rockstar's reported shift in work culture. The company faced substantial backlash over reported mandatory overtime and crunch during the development of Red Dead Redemption 2. To address these rumors, Rockstar had made efforts to improve working conditions, implementing policies like flexi time and pledging to avoid excessive overtime during GTA 6's development. This emphasis on better work-life balance aims to prioritize the well-being of the development team, which I think is great. Beyond character and setting revelations, the game's comedic tone is anticipated to differ from previous GTA titles as well. Rockstar aims to steer clear of humor that might be seen as offensive or derogatory towards marginalized groups. Negotiating satire in a world that often resembles its own parody presents a challenge for the developers, but they seem committed to crafting a tone that resonates positively. Additionally, reports suggest ongoing updates for GTA 6 post-launch, expanding the game with new missions and potentially even additional cities. This post-release development strategy aims to continually engage players and evolve the game world over time, just like we've seen with GTA 5 and GTA Online and GTA Roleplay and all the other spin-offs. So, buddy, we got a two and a bit-ish minute trailer. Firstly, I want to say I, I respect Rockstar for the quick pivot leaks yeah. the amount of the amount of time and the amount of people that have gone into working and making this release and this big unveiling the the biggest moment of gaming in in 2023 i feel really bad for them because it was all just went up in smoke really quickly because from what i can see allegedly like someone's child that works at rockstar leaked this trailer from what i saw but yeah rockstar quickly hit the gas, but you know what? Fuck it. We're dropping the trailer early. Boom. Here it is. Head on over to the Rockstar YouTube channel and check it out there on the Rockstar socials. But I firstly got to say, man, this might be one of the best looking, like I know it's just trailer and they were going to make it pop and sizzle as you want to. You want this first impression to be the right impression, but this might be one of the best looking games I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it looks absolutely stunning. And I'm so glad that the long awaited rumors from the last year or so or speculation um, that it's back in Vice City is true because I think Vi- Vice City is actually my favorite. Um, I love San Andreas, but that got a bit complicated with kind of the, you know, eating and go to the gym and doing all that kind of uh, stuff for stamina and everything, even though the storyline and the setting was sick and the soundtrack as well. But um, Vice City, I absolutely loved it. So I'm glad that they're there in a uh, a modern day setting. But the, yeah, the trailer was stunning. Um, I mm-hmm. love the whole idea of like the, the Bonnie and Clyde uh, kind of loved up duo. Um, so I'm guessing that's kind of hinting at the, the two playable characters again. The absurdity of like Florida, Miami, um, the potential of like diversity and kind of the map as well with them when it showed like the speedboat with, uh, with like the fan going through the going the through coast, sort of like the swamp lands the and swamp stuff lands like that. so the idea that there could be like swamp lands and um, the alligators and playing up to that one of the biggest things that's kind of stuck out to me the trailer was um, something that I kind of hadn't realized but like the there's a lot of like so, like you said with the social media but the TikToking and mm. that TikTok wasn't around when GTA Five was there in 2013 and I guess the more um, pivoting towards influencers, content creators, always online, that short attention span and how Rockstar loves to kind of parody uh, what they think is America or society in, in that kind of way with the, their take on Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So um, that's going to be cool. And that's kind of the kind of triggered me 
or triggered the thought in my mind like oh shit that's probably the thing i'm looking forward to most uh whether it's the city being diverse or you know being in vice city and having awesome you know kind of scarface inspired uh uh, stuff like they did in Vice City or the the, the soundtrack uh, or, the, or the vibe alone. But the whole idea of like what has been invented or what is the world like since GTA 5 and what's going to be implemented and Rockstar's take on it um, could be could be a bit wild. So especially with like Elon Musk and X and, you know, Tesla and the self-driving, you know, tank car that they have and TikTok and weird AI and Boston Dynamics and all that weird shit that I, I just can't wait to see what uh, what they do with it. Yeah, the story, well, I, I can't say we, we know 110%, <laughs> but it's, it's going to be a time. Like the the main story, the side it's quest, fun. the characters you meet along the way, like it is going to weave together maybe a little less absurdity in, in iterations of GTA past because they are sort of trying to make it a little bit more little bit more grounded so we'll see just how crazy they get with some of the some of the stories and the characters and the missions that you go on but yeah the the vibe of vice city it looks phenomenal whether it be in the you know the cbd based burrows or you're getting out into the wilderness it looked awesome there was a lot more alligator coverage in this trailer yes. than i anticipated um and a lot of like vehicle based focus so we're seeing a lot of vehicles and motorbikes and stuff like that people squirting around on bikes and and doing donuts and so there might be a heavy racing element tied into this but i do like that we've got the male and female leads like they're they're a couple they're a partnership they're a duo they're a couple of budding criminals yeah we know that uh yeah lucia is the female protagonist i couldn't find the name of her male partner anyway. unnamed unnamed in the trailer so they're not confirmed Okay, we'll just call him um, call him James for now. So Lucia and James, <laughs> they're they're gonna they're gonna be great together, and it's it's gonna be interesting to see how they play off each other, and and if you can sort of change between the characters in real time, or if they're more on sort of rail based stories where you're jumping between missions and and dealing with each character's perspective during those times. But yeah, I was I was absolutely blown away by the character models, the detail in the character models, like mm. seeing some of the, the the scenes in this trailer where you can see like a, a couple, like a woman and a couple of dudes have been sort of out, out in the boonies and they're covered in mud and just sort of seeing how the environment looks and plays on, on and off them on the character model and, and how they're interacting and watching the grass and the ground move as they step and the lighting bounce. Like it is, it is stunning. And I like, that from what I've seen, they've confirmed this is a PlayStation 5, Xbox Series X focus. They're not trying to make this thing backwards compatible. So any PS4 users and stuff, sorry. But uh, you've got a year and a half plus-ish to, to upgrade your kit till then. So I think this is really going to put current gen through its paces because mm. my goodness gracious, it is a visual feast. It'll be an audible-based feast as well because you know the the radio stations are going to be extensive and there's going to be banger after banger after banger on those radio stations. And I can't wait to cruise around Vice City and just get lost in this world again and and do nothing but also experience much. Yeah, I'm very keen to jump back in. The thing that... um, Another thing that's kind of drawing me in as well is like the, the dynamic between the two characters and it being like, I guess, a potential relationship. Um, and how that bounced off like we had the three characters in gta 5 but even though they had kind of relationship it's kind of like they were pretty much strangers that kind of just bounced off each other out of kind of criminal uh or world necessity whereas there might be more interesting kind of story elements that they can have uh, with these two characters being closer so um maybe a little bit more heartfelt moments or depressive or heartbreaking moments uh, or uh, maybe some higher highs where with, with two characters that are linked so closely. Yeah, I wonder if the narrative will lean more on the tone of, say, Red Dead Redemption 2 as opposed to a Grand Theft Auto 5, where, yeah, it is still big and, and grounded in reality with GTA 5, but there was some crazy absurdity there where Red Dead's a lot more boots on the ground, semi-relatable and, and semi-understandable in comparison, but we'll see, we'll see. And it's also... Yeah, interesting that they've confirmed, yeah, 2025 is the release window. They didn't say specifically when that will fall in 2025. But uh, yeah, a lot of the the beat writers and, and rumor breakers out there 
were alleging that it was going to be the back end of next year, but uh, they're wrong. They're wrong because, yeah, 2025 is the time. So we've got a, another 18 or so months, I'd imagine, talking about this game and, and seeing it slowly get revealed more and more with gameplay and, and probably some some trailers introducing us and getting us familiar with Lucia and her, her nameless Bo James and just this world yeah. in general. So I'm excited to learn more as they just slow play this reveal, but also man, leakers fuck off. It's not That's right. Yeah. Hate it. I, I also like the idea that they could like do something like Cuba, maybe like a story base there, like where they start out in GTA five, uh, the start where whatever town they start in, um, or maybe like something to do with the Bermuda triangle down the bottom of like the florida keys um which would kind of tie into gta's zany ufo and all that weird shit that they do yes. so they, they got a lot of scope having it in this like location and not having it as like your yeah, los santos or um whatever they called new york i've forgotten already yeah i can't remember either i just know that this <laughs> new york this map and this world is going to be huge and the fact that there's rumors circulating that post-launch content will add additional cities and areas to explore like it is going to be a giant giant landscape to paint with all kinds of violence and crime and absurdity so yeah bring it on i think that reveal trailer was not just enough but it, it got the internet world and the gaming world talking in a positive light i didn't see anything on the on on twitter or x today negatively spinning this trailer at all which was nice it all seems mm. to be unanimous and the views and everything like people are just gta mad like it's it's insane how quickly a reveal or a trailer can break the internet from rockstar yep uh do you reckon this shows up at the game awards with any kind of follow-up information or that's it that's all we see i think that's all we see for a while that's always i think yeah. so too you, you know jeff keely's like humping whoever he can's leg at rockstar to try and get some <laughs> type of exclusive <laughs> But I feel there's not much point. Like, just let this thing stand alone and marinate now. Like, yeah. the Game Awards in a couple of days. Rock, Rockstar doesn't need Jeff Keighley. Jeff Keighley no. needs Rockstar. But Rockstar 100%. are like, get out of here, little man. Go go take selfies with Hideo again. You know, Tell us how good a friend you are with Kojima. <laughs> All right. Oh, and um, the last little bits we're going to unpack here. It's not the news, but we're just going to throw down our pizza predictions for the Game Awards because the Game Awards are happening this coming friday slash thursday depending on where you are in the world and we talked about it in previous episodes of thd that we're going to try and make this like a, a our, our oscars we're going to focus on the big five awards we're going to put our predictions on the table and see who sticks or misses the landing and then the winner will be getting a delicious hot fresh tasty pizza delivered to them on behalf of the loser so Buddy, the five categories we're going to be focusing on is best score and music, best performance, best narrative, best independent game, and game of the year. We've got some similarities, but then we've also got some uh, some very different predictions. Mm-hmm. So, uh, where do we start? Do we just go best? Let's just go top to bottom. We've got it here on the run sheet. Let's do it. All right, all right. So, best score and music. This one, we are both going with Final Fantasy 16, and the composer on that is Mayoshi Soken. So yeah, we're we're both in um, uniformity there on that. That's I high. have played a little bit of Final Fantasy 16. I have listened to this soundtrack a lot on Spotify. I do love those big, grand, epic fantasy vibes, and some of the the songs that accompany the boss battles. Holy guacamole! Do I feel like I could take on an elephant charging at me when I listen to some of these songs? Like, <laughs> they are so big and so bold. So we're in lockstep there. Best performance is where we have our first differences of opinion. I've gone with Neil Newbon, who is playing Astarian from Baldur's Gate 3. And you've gone with Ben Starr, who plays Clive Rossfield, who is from Final Fantasy 16. So that could be the first one that might lead us to pizza victory. Could be, could be. I actually played Final Fantasy uh, 16. So my first two predictions are kind of like based off reputation when it comes to composing and the kind of, like you said before, that grandioso scale and the reputation that Final Fantasy 16 has uh, for being epic. But the best performance one is just the kind of outside of Idris Elbows, the person that I recognize the most who seems to be the, doing the most campaigning. Um, of course, he's on our good friend Paul James's dev diary recently, uh, Ben Starr, and had, a, had an interview over there. But um yeah, it's just more of a vibe. And he picked it up at the Golden Joysticks uh, for best performance as well. But okay. that generally doesn't 
mean too much in the gaming world as like when your golden globes do compare um as far as your oscars and kind of give you some form guide but um i feel like he's the most out there at the moment so that's kind of just a semi-educated semi mm, he's the person i've seen the most even though i don't interact in that world type vibe that, that's a smart play. That's a smart play because, yeah, he, Ben Starr is very active on the socials and he's been very actively campaigning for Final Fantasy 16. So maybe that will get him a little bit more love with the 100 or so media slash content creator outlets that voted on these. So who knows if Ben Starr takes home the bickies. We did talk offline a little bit too about just the gravity that a name like Idris Elba could have with mm. this too because he is the Hollywood heavyweight amongst the five nominees for Best Performance. And he did really, really great in um, Phantom Liberty. I was a big, big fan of that, and I was close to close to voting. But I'm I'm going with the more of the uh, universal fandom slash love slash obsession slash crushing that Astarian has sort of brought to the game space as well. And Neil Newborn doing that vocal work and that mocap work is mm-hmm. phenomenal in that. The next category we also have some differences of opinion so that's best narrative i've gone with alan wake 2 by remedy and you've gone with Baldur's gate 3 by larian games yeah so i haven't played either game and the one i <laughs> the one i want to play is alan wake 2 um specifically because it seems like a buddy as fuck game based on its influences and just um some of the things i've heard about the style of game and how it kind of changes things up um I've heard some semi spoilers, I guess, when it comes to how the game kind of plays out and the meta narrative in it, but um, it kind of gives me big immortality vibes from last year. So everything I hear about Alan Wake 2, the narrative and the story is epic and just batshit crazy. So I'm kind of like pulling for that to be the win versus Baldur's Gate, which is what I have selected. But I feel like Baldur's Gate has the potential to do a sweep, even though I didn't pick that for performance. Um, so yeah, it's just a just another vibe thing because boulders get i guess like the it's the breadth of narrative right like it's kind of like D D, choose your own adventure mm-hmm. make make your own type of thing so maybe it's kind of like how much you can do versus this awesome condensed story but i feel like both have impacted gaming heavy this year yeah both i would not be sad if either one because they're the they're the two standouts for me I, I think you described Baldur's Gate perfect talking about that breadth, but maybe maybe just that scope is a little too overwhelming at times too because it is so many adventures that you could choose in comparison to Alan Wake 2, which is a little bit more linear, but also just the, the genre and media bending that happens in Alan Wake 2. Like, yeah, I want to avoid spoilers because the story in this game is some of the best that I've experienced in gaming, but also in like horror, thriller, science fiction from film or tv in a good long while like this is this is like if this is peak remedy then like <laughs> give me this forever and, and if you've got another level to go to holy fucking shit strap in yeah. because this is very very special the story is phenomenal and the story is probably the best part about alan wake too so i feel just like you said with Baldur's gate 3 both these games are on a lot of categories on a lot of dockets and either could potentially run away with a lot of these awards but I'm not sad whichever ones of these wins ultimately, but hopefully it's Alan Wake 2 so I can get some pizza in my belly. <laughs> All right. The next uh, the next category we're going to be voting on is best independent game. Another difference of opinion between the two of us. I've gone with Dredge, the little indie that could from Black Salt Games, and you've gone with Cocoon from Geometric Interactive. How are you feeling about this one? This is the one that breaks my heart the most and has come down to strategically voting because I reviewed Dredge earlier in uh, the year with from Explosion Network. Shout outs. Um, go check out my written review over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I gave it a 10 out of 10. Dredge is currently my game of the year behind Zelda. In a year where I love, uh, you know, a Zelda came, came was out and is most likely going to be game of the year for me because zelda is one of my all-time favorite franchises uh if you take that out and put like a big asterisk on zelda dredge probably is my game of the year so um it hurts to vote against it i want it to win but i'm gonna go uh cocoon i don't think viewfinder um kind of hit what it needed to be sea of stars in that category i feel is like a little bit niche being in a uh, turn-based rpg that's like kind of a throwback to old snes type style games and maybe not all the voters kind of uh played that and i feel like dredge is actually the most underrated or maybe underplayed game from this list and that sounds dumb because it did get nominated but um and i know they have specific 
panels that decide this portion of the the voting context uh, not across the board but when it comes to voting on winners maybe enough players just didn't play dredge and then day of the diver the whole controversy around that that would be we spoke about it offline that would be kind of hilarious if that kind of somehow picked up the the win but yeah i feel everything i've heard from cocoon has been outstanding and amazing from uh, all my trusted kind of reviewers and uh, people that i read or watch on, on youtube and stuff so um yeah that that's kind of the the one i'm gonna throw my hat on uh strategically but i want dredge to win i want to lose that category i want dredge to pick up the win 100 percent. that's that's fair that's fair like i haven't played a minute of cocoon i've rolled credits on dredge and i'm looking forward to jumping into the dlc because it is a very special game and yeah not enough people talk about how special it is i just love that we're seeing constant home runs being hit in australia new zealand from the game dev scene like we are in some pretty rare air at the moment as far as the the games we're bringing out constantly winning countless awards locally and abroad and i hope dredge can continue that uh tradition that we're sort of living in now but cocoon from what i've seen like i've watched people play it and i've read reviews it looks stunning it looks like a really great special experience and i need to try that out sometime from what i can understand cocoon was very much like a passion project of a game as well so i think that might embody the spirit of this award if that's a thing to say (laughs) but maybe i'm thinking about that too deep because yeah the fact dave the diver is on this list i worry how long ago the votes were cast measuring up to when the controversy about them not being an indie studio Mm. was widely acknowledged and is someone like a Jeff Keighley going to retcon that? I don't think he will because he stood pretty neutral on this when it all came out. And he was just like, oh, the votes are the votes. My bad. Like, you know, he's not really being accountable. He didn't scrub it from the list. He didn't bring in it in the potentially the sixth game to fill that spot. He's just kept it on this docket. And it's got a lot of positive press. A lot of people were talking about Dave the Diver. So I would also not be surprised to see it win and having some big old internet-based discourse. God, that would be hilarious announced. because the same people that, like I said, we said last week, or like I spouted last week, the same people that nominated are the same people that are now getting angry about it because they aren't smart enough or weren't vetted well yeah. enough to kind of do that. And if they've suddenly somehow voted for it before all this kind of hoo has come out, like, oh my God, that would be something else. It would just yeah. be a big cell phone for the... Uh, the games media industry yeah like voters to to paraphrase australia's finest john opec put in the work take the time (laughs) to do the research and make sure that yeah dave the diver is not owned by some multi-million dollar conglomerate that makes it uh null and void in the independent scene so we'll see like i would not be at all surprised to see dave the diver take home this one but my heart and my hope is on dredge go dredge do it yeah it wouldn't surprise me to see cocoon or maybe see stars get some love yeah, because it was CS also been well. widely praised across the internet as well. So, so we'll see. And then the big one, game of the year. We are in lockstep here. We've both predicted that Larian Games' as Baldur's Gate 3 is going to take home game of the year for 2023. You feeling pretty confident about this one? I think so. Um, just the whole talk about it, the zeitgeist, um, just everything about it. Like if you told me earlier in the year that something would beat Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for Game of the Year, I would have like scoffed and laughed at your face. But uh, it seemed to kind of like come out of nowhere, even though there was a lot of hype for it, but just in the way and the kind of the reach that it's had and the way that it's impacted those uh, people that have played it. So um, yeah, I'd be very surprised if Baldur's Gate 3 doesn't win. It's kind of seems like it's the favorite at the moment, mm-hmm. but who knows? You are in a category that has a Zelda game in it as well. Yeah, and, and like it's it's a very respectable list of obviously Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Marvel Spider-Man 2, Resident Evil 4, Super Mario Brothers Wonder, and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. So six great games, but I feel three of them stand apart with Tears of the Kingdom, Alan Wake 2, and Baldur's Gate 3 as the, the only three I can see winning this title. Yep. It wouldn't surprise me if Alan Wake 2 sneaks in here and, and rides some of the momentum, but I feel... Baldur's Gate 3 is the odds-on favorite and I'm not at all sad about that because it is so special and I'm still reflecting if it's my game of the year overall or Alan Wake 2 is, but they're the two that are up there for me. Maybe Spider-Man's going to web-sling in at the last minute and and disrupt (laughs) for me too, but yeah, they're they're my two that I'm I'm, uh, debating before I go to bed every night at the moment because I love my time with both so, so much. So uh, yeah, they're our, our... Game Awards predictions. 
the game awards are happening in yeah approximately two and a half days time we will uh announce the winner and the loser on friday and um yeah the winner will be eating some celebratory pizza maybe straight away maybe breakfast pizza because this will be playing in the morning i'm always down for some breakfast pizza so i'll be at uh, work so uh i can get a pizza delivered to your work if you win Look at that, already conceding defeat. See, I just set him up there, just uh, told him I would be at work. I said nothing <sighs> about that. And he's like, I could deliver a pizza to your work. That is loser mentality, people. He's already defeated. He already knows. Maybe it's a sympathy pizza because I won five for five. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to send you one of those little personal, the personal pan pizza with the little the little mini snack garlic bread. You know the ones you get now? It's like yeah, a little yeah, pizza yeah. and little side treats. I'll send you one of them as like a, a, little, a little sympathy gift. We don't have a tiebreaker at the moment, so um, we could also do this for the memes, right? Mm-hmm. We have, um, if it is somehow a tie over these five categories, even though we have three different uh, kind of picks, which can... No, it can happen. be, like, if, if, say, best narrative, we miss out completely, or best independent and someone True. else. True. It could still somehow happen. Maybe we order each other a pizza, so we're both buying a pizza, but we're oh, sending it to each yeah. other. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Unless like we come idea. up with something else. And Who we knows? have to put like one random ingredient on. Like we'll get each other's <laughs> respective pizza orders, but then we get to like pick one random thing <laughs> to add to it or to change. Uh, interesting. Yeah, I think that could be fun. But uh, yeah, let's see how things go. Let us know your predictions for our just designed, just configured uh, Game Awards Oscars edition here of the five, the big five, best score of music, best performance, best narrative, best independent game and game of the year. But if you're looking for other things to do this week, don't worry, because we've got you covered. The week that's yet to come, presented by Dash Water. Shout out to Dash Water. I am enjoying my fantastic carbonated lemon-flavored Dash Water right now. Remember, no calories, no sugars, no sweeteners, just all that good stuff in there in a fantastic phallic-like can that uh, tastes just as good, whether it be cold or room temperature like that because I've been sitting on this can for a while, but it's still hydrating. (laughs) If you're looking for things to listen to, I've got another episode of More Than Hentai dropping in this upcoming week where myself and the aforementioned Jamie Apps are tackling Tokyo Ghoul, which is a hell of a rewatch and a hell of a discussion. If you want to get over to the cinema, you can check out Tokyo Godfather's making its way back to the cinema and the big screen. You can also check out The Boy and the Heron, Master Gardener, Silent Night, and One True Loves. Any interesting things on the streamers? Leave the world behind. Merry Little Batman, The Sacrifice. Obviously, we mentioned the Game Awards coming at you live this coming Thursday and Friday. As far as games coming out this week, Arizona Sunshine 2 on the PSVR 2. Alaskan Road Truckers coming out (laughs) on just about everything. Avatar Frontiers of Pandora. It's coming out this week. What? Okay. Okay. Evil Nun, The Broken Mask, Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trailer, Resident Evil 4 VR Mode coming out on PSVR 2 as well. The Outer Wilds Archaeologist Edition making its way to Switch. The Day Before coming out on Steam. Still don't believe it. And Final Fantasy VII Ever Crisis making its way to PC. So there's a whole heap of things to watch and play and see and do, buddy. Anything on that list go, you know what? I'm in. I'm going to go check that out. I'm going to go pick that up and I'm going to go do all the things. Um, out of the games, no, there's nothing there. But the one that kind of piques my interest as far as like uh, what, how the industry will react or whether it's going to be good or not is definitely like Avatar. Um, since like before the podcast, you were saying kind of you feel like it's had no promotion. I guess I work at a retailer, so I kind of see the the four ways and the two ways that kind of uh, go up. But um, I don't know if there's too much hype for it. But the big one is the day before, right? It comes out. Sorry, <clears throat> it comes out air quotes yeah. uh, but he's using it, parentheses right now for that listeners on um december 7th uh and this this there's no fucking way this is a real game i'm sorry i just i cannot believe it um and i cannot wait because i've got like a blue heaven milkshake bet with zach jackson from well played that this is a fake game it's not real it will not be playable in any state and he tells me oh yeah i even doubled or nothing him so i've got two blue heaven Ooh. milkshakes on the line Hell this, yeah. This Friday. Your insides and, are going to um, hate you if you drink both of them at the same time, but like a milkshake's a great time. See, and once again, your language has assumed that I've already won because I am right. Day before, fake game. So I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to that being like, oh, you can buy it and then you open it and you can never find a game. And the only people that can find games on the internet are these like fake accounts that are actually run by the people that have developed in the game and no one else can find games. And it's this big, massive conspiracy and steam comes in, they refund. There's like class action lawsuit, blah, blah, blah. All the things are, ah, that's my prediction for you. Everything 
Buddy just said, I completely agree with because, yeah, I feel this game is fake. It's fictitious. It's nothing more than a media campaign by Fantastic, the developer behind this, because it's one of the most wishy-washy development cycles and media junkets that I've ever seen as far as the non-committal answers, the broad brush responses. the It's just so much puff and smoke that, yeah, I feel it's fake and it's going to come out on Friday and people are going to be heckin' pissed. So uh, I'm curious to see what happens with it because, yeah, I still don't believe it's a real thing. And I'm curious to see how Avatar Frontiers of Pandora reviews. Mm, Like, you know, like Ubisoft, they know how to make a good game for the most part. They know how to make a very pretty game nearly all of the time. And they've had a very uneven year so far. So let's see if they can stick this landing. Let's see how much James Cameron influence was in this. Uh, Or is he just, you know, just selling off the rights and clipping the ticket off, off, uh, you know, sales of, of this but yeah i i enjoy the movies but i've got no interest in playing a game of those movies yeah i don't know just who's this for avatar comes up as big like I, I, I know it's like one of the highest grossing movies in in the world um so i shouldn't say this but it definitely comes up as like a dad movie like how many people are playing avatar I, I, it makes sense to make a game right you mm. sell that that many people watch it, it makes that much money i don't know We'll see. Yeah. Um, it's just a fascination. It really is. It's curious. And the fact, like you mentioned, you've seen it because your your boots on the ground in the retail space yeah, as yeah, far oh, as you're yes. seeing yep. marketing. But I've seen nothing on the internet. I've seen no like emails from anyone in PR from Ubisoft on this at all, which is weird to me. Like usually yeah. leading up to it, the months and then the weeks before, you'll get updated press releases and assets to share on a podcast or on your socials. I've had none of that from Ubisoft mm. on this. So I don't know. What's going on? Or either that or they've kicked me off the mailing list. One of the two. But either way, I've seen nothing anywhere. So I'm genuinely curious to see what Frontiers of Pandora is all about when it comes out in like two days time. Like there isn't even any public releases, I don't think. Let me just quickly skim Metacritic to see if anything's out there yet. But I don't remember seeing any any early early access releases. It looks like it's going to be like a day one type of drop, which is usually a scary scary sort of foreshadowing for a game i feel mm-hmm. like if you're not getting early access and getting those releases out several days ahead of time yeah there's nothing eh? tbd tbd <laughs> so let's see what happens in a couple of days time because yeah there ain't nothing out there from anyone in the media and the critic space but uh we'll see let's see if ubisoft yep. have, have sort of snuck a snuck a good release in at the end or if it's going to be a complete turd and the other big thing, um, I guess, for those that people that like care in, in retail land and kind of um, with PlayStation's PS, and depending on when you're listening to this, PS5 Slim is also out uh, tomorrow, today, Wednesday, 6th of December, uh, for people that care about that. So interesting. another interesting thing to see how well that does uh, in the lead up to Christmas specifically, because I think everyone that wanted a PS5 for Christmas has already brought one. So I'd love to see kind of who's buying this and um, how many people are getting it. Does, does JB have any sweet trade in your, your legacy thick boy PS5 to get a discounted slim? Uh, not in store. I think they run through a third party that you can do online, you kind of fill out the form and it kind of gives you a quote and then you can kind of send a reply paid thing away and then they will give you a gift card. But that's kind of run as like through a third party. So I okay. think they do PlayStation now. Hmm. Sounds about right. But yeah, that brings us to the end of episode 344 of THG. Buddy, have you got anything you wanted to mention or shout out before we shut down this studio for another finite period of time? Uh, no, I think I'm I'm pretty good. Yeah. Play your gaming backlog. That's what I'm getting through. I'm almost done with <laughs> Spider-Man. I'm going to get through my uh, indies that I'm pretty excited for. So I'm working through that. Find some movies. Everything's going good. It's all coming together. Everything is going very good. And yeah, this brings us to the end of the the mainline or the regular THC-based programming as far as your, your news reviews and opinion piece wrap-ups every week because the next three episodes is going to be covering off our annual Festivus. So we're going to be airing video game grievances with myself, Buddy's going to be appearing as well as a couple other fantastic individuals. Then uh, myself and a very special guest is going to be doing our favorite things of 2023 and then we're going to be ending with the biddy so we're going to be ending with the entirely community driven awards decided and governed by y'all out there in the 8-bit nation you still got some time to get your votes and your opinions in for festivus as well as the biddies just check the socials at we are 8-bit for those links to go on through and, and chuck your thoughts and your opinions out there because we'd love to hear from you guys and uh help shape 
the biddies and festivus to be bigger badder and better than ever before but um ape nation you can find me at brendan eight bitch you can find buddy at buddy watson 12 are we going to get any announcements about radio watson are we going to get any announcements that you're coming back to the microphone in a semi-permanent basis you got any spoilers or any hot tips you can share with us before we shut off like a on my notes app i've got like a whole page full of ideas and things but uh, <laughs> that i keep updating and then doing but um no i've i'm enjoying doing this and it's kind of made me it's it's definitely scratching itch and oh yes made me uh reevaluate some stuff but we'll we'll see nothing nothing yet nothing concrete yet buddy come back uh, buddy the, you know i just did a different complete different i did flash gordon then sorry <laughs> i still enjoyed it i thought that was great but um, yeah, Ape Nation, be sure to rate you subscribe this podcast as well as all the other podcasts you listen to on the regular because those ratings and reviews mean the world to us, takes no time, costs no money, and it's just positive karma. So pay it forward where you can. But until next time, Ape Bit Nation, much love. And stay hungry. We'll see you around.